Gary in Manhattan? Yes, that's correct. How are you, Gary? I'm doing very good, Mr. Delonte. How about you? Oh, just Matt. Matt's fine, but thanks. I'm fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, the reason I was calling, I actually spoke with your uh, co-host, Martin, I believe it is, in, uh, through an email, and I wanted to present a positive case here today uh, for intelligent design. Oh, all right. Uh, okay. Yeah, specifically, I wanted to discuss uh, irreducible complexity and uh, the Dover trial with you guys. Uh, first, I read on your uh, Iron Chariots page, Matt, which I have to say is a very good encyclopedia, very informative. Um, I hear intelligent design is just another form of creationism, and I wanted to ask, what makes you think that? Well, first of all, I don't write everything that's up there at Iron Chariots. Uh, as a matter of fact, I probably haven't written much of what's up at Iron Chariots. Um, but I have said before that uh, intelligent design is is creationism in a lab coat or uh, a Trojan horse for creationism, et cetera. And it's because mostly it's about the way that it's used. Um, what what happened? I mean, we we well, if you actually look it uh, look it up, we've we've found the transitional form between creationism and intelligent design, and it's cur design proponentists, and it was. <laughs> Uh, of pandas and people, obviously, we talked about in the Dover trial. Um, everything. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could I please respond to that point, actually? The sure. design proponents. This? Sure. I'm, I'm really glad you brought this up because um, I realize this is one of the leading uh, criticisms against intelligent design. And what I have in front of me here, actually, is uh, both that reference to the exact quote which contains that term mm -hmm. and uh, a copy of some of the drafts, actually, of the book of pandas and people, which for whatever reason are not quoted. And I have, I'm reading some of the quotes from them here, and I'd like to read one of them onto the air. Because what, what are the dates of those drafts? Because it was it was basically they bookended um, a Supreme Court ruling that removed creationism, and the drafts that came before it had creationism and creationists, and the drafts that came after it had intelligent design and intelligent design proponents. Yeah, but my, my argument's not that the term wasn't in there. I mean, you read a lot of evolution writings and the term creationists is in there. But what I'm saying is from the content of the actual draft, they say statements like I have right here in front of me, uh, some master intellect is the creator of life, but such observable instances of information can't tell us if the intellect behind them is natural or supernatural. This is not a question that science can answer. And from what I from what I uh, gathered from my research, this is the same draft in which uh, C design proponents was found. So what you have here is a quote that's basically saying, "We know the supernatural is not part of science. We don't want to go there." So I feel like that's showing the context of the book. While the term creationist might not be in there, it's making it very clear that the purpose of this book is not to invoke uh, the supernatural. Well, it, does, it doesn't really matter, though. I mean, ultimately, what you have got going on here is a whole lot of spin that the uh, creationist movement essentially concocted as a way of more or less passing what's called the lemon, the lemon test, right? Uh, this whole issue of church-state separation violation. Creationism was not able to get a foothold in science classes because it was very clearly religiously motivated. And so they were like, well... All we, clearly what we have to do is repackage this. We have to put this in some sort of form that sounds scientific, that passes legal muster, so that there cannot be any kind of objection to it on legal grounds uh, in terms of promoting religion and religious teachings. And that's really uh, what you, this whole exercise in replacing uh, creator with uh, uh, intelligent designer, with entity, wh whatever sort of safe word you might have, design proponents uh, in, in, uh, in, in replacing creationists. These are all just ways to sort of, uh, you know, get around legal hassles. And the, and the proof of that you know? is in the statement that you just read. Yeah. You read it and you think that this is uh, telling that, they, you know, they're not trying to, to meddle with science. But it opens uh, with a statement about a creator. It, it opens with an intelligent creator and they say it could be natural or supernatural. And yet they say this is beyond the realm of science. Well, if it's natural, it's not beyond science. So they're negating the possibility that it's natural as soon as they say that this is outside the realm of science. Well, what they're saying in the in passage that I just read to you is we understand that uh, our theory of intelligent design might very well, in fact, have religious implications. But what they're saying is they want to stick to the claim that there may be signs of intelligence detectable in nature, such as uh, looking at the bacterial flagellum and irreducible complexity. And 
okay, if we can... Yeah, but claims about design. bacterial flagellum and irreducible complexity have all been blown out of the water in terms of being evidence for some sort of design. We understand the evolutionary processes that lead to these things. Uh, you know, in organisms that you know that certain ID proponents are saying you know are evidence of irreducible complexity. Kenneth Miller has completely knocked irreducible complexity right off the table, and so, there's a lot of studying being uh, there's a lot of research and a lot of science uh, done to understand the Ken, the Ken Miller claim. Uh, you said Ken Miller completely blew irreducible complexity out of the water. I, I really would like to respond to that. Yeah, well, if you can, sure. I mean, if you claim to know more about biology than one of the leading biologists in the country, who also happens mm -hmm. to be a theist. By all means. Well, yeah, you know. I, I never, uh, I never made that claim. Okay. Certainly, I knew more about biologists than biologists in the country. What, what I'm saying is, I think, um, and correctly, I might add, Michael Behe and countless others in the intelligent design movement have responded to the claims that uh, Dr. Miller has made, and I actually think uh, Dr. Miller strawmans uh, Dr. Behe's definition of irreducible complexity. And I have actually right in front of me here a quote from Michael Behe's Darwin's Black Box page 40 for uh, all the viewers who are watching over here, and it says, uh, even if this is from Michael Behe's own book where he published this idea, even if the system is irreducibly complex, one can't definitively rule out the possibility of an indirect circuitous route. As the complexity of an interacting system increases, though the likelihood of such an indirect route drops precipitously, precipitously, and as the number of unexplained, irreducibly complex biological systems increases, our confidence that Darwin's criterion of failure has been met skyrockets towards the maximum that science allows. So what Dr. Beatty is saying in that uh, passage that I just read is, yeah, co-option might work, indirect, uh, indirect pathways for things like the flagellum might have been found, but the more of those things you find that if you remove one part away, uh, the system doesn't work. But that's exactly function. where that's where Miller that's where Miller completely knocks Behe's point out of the water because uh, Behe's whole idea about IC is that what you just said. If you remove one part of of this entire complex mechanism that he is saying is irreducibly complex, if you remove one part, then it can't work. Uh, and and, and its current function, for example. So let's talk so about who cares. But who cares? Who the cares? point is, uh, Miller Functions gives a very change. Yes, Miller gives a very clear example uh, in which no fewer than forty elements are removed from the flagellum's tail, you're, and they have a function. They have, as Matt said, the function is simply different. Okay, okay. Uh, elements of an yeah. organism have a function, and then they come together. They, uh, a different function is now performed. Uh, the original function is no longer formed, but they simply do other things in their earlier stages. That, okay, I understand yeah. your point. I understand Dr. Miller's point. What B is saying here is, first of all, if you concede the point, you move one part away, the flagellum doesn't function as a motor. That's what B is saying. Now if you find other systems that do that, what Miller has attempted to do with the Type 3 secretory system, which is, I believe is what you're referring to, uh, mm -hmm. with with taking away 40 of the flagellum 50 proteins, what Miller is saying is, yeah, we found something that might be an intermediate. What Behe is saying is, one, the uh, one is you have to account for now this huge indirect process for all of these systems which are irreducibly complex. Because no, no, one so, part hang, away, hang, the system can't function in its present form. Hang, hang on, hang on, not, hang okay. on. Before we get to the furthermore, I, I put it that nobody has demonstrated that a system is in fact irreducibly complex. They have just asserted it, and it is an argument from ignorance. It is a claim that, look at this system, we can't think of anything that it could do or any other way that it could have come about, therefore I will declare it to be irreducibly complex. And I, and I assert that that is an argument from ignorance. First, you need to actually demonstrate that an irreducibly complex system exists. And when Behe has tried with his prime examples, it has been demonstrated that, in fact, that is not an irreducibly complex system, provided we allow for function to change. Okay, uh, Matt, uh, just so I can, uh, I just want to clarify um, uh, something that you just said. Are you saying um, over here that irreducible complexity is not falsifiable, or just that uh, no irreducibly complex system has been presented? I just want to clear that up. Um... I, I, I think, I think both, because as irreducible complexity has been presented, I would say it is an argument from ignorance and that we haven't been able, we can't think of anything um, 
any other function, and therefore this system is irreducibly complex, is the way that's been de that, that has been asserted in the past. And so those assertions have been, I would say, unfalsifiable. Whether or not the prospect is entirely unfalsifiable, I don't know. Um, first, we'd need somebody to actually demonstrate a system that's irreducibly complex and also demonstrate how they came by the understanding that it was, in fact, irreducibly complex. And neither of those has taken place. I disagree with you completely. I think actually both of them uh, have taken place. What are the I'll, examples? I'll respond to both yeah. of them. First of all, I have um, a quote here from Judge Jones's ruling in the Kissinger versus Dover trial on page, 70, <sighs> page 76. Uh, Judge Jones actually says right here, and this is from the testimony from Dr. Kenneth Miller and uh, Dr. Robert Pennock, the two expert witnesses in the case, as irreducible complexity is only a negative argument against evolution, it is refutable and accordingly testable. So what you have here, and he cites Miller's testimony for that. Mm -hmm. So Judge Jones agrees that the concept as a whole is in fact falsifiable. Dr. Behe, what I th and I think he's done correctly, is you go and you take a bacterial flagellum and you knock out one of its proteins. If it can't function as a motor, under Behe's definition, it's irreducibly complex. So well, I don't know well that's, the, that's the whole problem. What we're trying to tell you is we don't, th uh, we don't think, and uh, quite frankly, the majority of people in Behe's profession don't think that his definition has any sort of validity. What, what difference does it make? He's setting these parameters okay, as a way of saying, all right, well, here, here is a way in which something can be, under my definition, irreducibly complex and cannot have evolved into the form it's in now. And it's, it's the premise, okay, by which he establishes these definitions that is not held to be valid. No, be, let, me, let me ask be, you something. Let me just, and, and let's do this without, you know, reading extensive quotations, okay? Uh, if, if you think intelligent design is valid as a scientific concept, Okay. Then uh, let's talk about falsifiable. You know sure. how it's falsifiable. Absolutely. What do you what do you think a non-designer designed universe slash life form slash world would look like? What would a world and uh, full of life or not full of life look like that was non and let's say it let's non God designed. So how would I falsify the entire theory of intelligent design is what you're saying? Well, first of all, this, there's, it's no, not a theory. there's no theory. Let's just the, co this, the, the concept, of the hypothesis, the premise of intelligent design. The, okay, the so premise is... Okay, falsify the hypothesis of intelligent design? Uh, dude, just, just intelligent sure design. I intelligent I design meaning that all of this, everything here that, that we see, that we live, ourselves, our world, our universe, people, dogs, cats, these are the product of intelligent design. Some, in other words, some sort of designer, an intelligent agency, put this together with teleological intent, like there was a goal in mind. That's, okay. that's the premise of intelligent design. Am I correct, or am I stating that incorrectly? Well, the, the premise of intelligent design is just that there are certain features in biology that are best explained by an intelligent cause. I mean, to the degree that, uh, as far as that goes, I mean, that's debated even amongst the intelligent design proponents. You, okay. have, some who were, you have some who reject common descent, then you have some who accept common Fine, descent. Fine, but, but like I'm, just talking, so. I'm just talking at, at a basic level. What would a non-intelligently designed universe look like? What would a non-intelligently designed life form look like? Okay, um, well, you would be able, well, that's the thing. I, well, the way I would falsify it is I would go and I would uh, find, like, I mean, even Richard Dawkins admits that there is an appearance of design in nature. I mean, in, in his book, But appearances aren't nature. realities, right? We're, we're talking about just, if you want to state as a hypothesis, okay. the universe, planet Earth, and all living things upon it are the product of the design on the part of an intelligent agency, whether it's natural, supernatural, God, the great pumpkin, whoever. Okay. In order okay. to under, in, order, in order to understand that it's cold outside, you have to have a frame of reference. You have to understand what hot is to right. understand that it's cold. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah. in order to understand, in order to be able to say this is a designed universe, what would a non-designed world look like? What would a non-God-designed living thing look like? Well, to falsify intelligent design, what I would do is I would go and find things that uh, that supposedly have the designed attributes, like specified complexity, and then prove that they weren't in fact made by design. Because you have what you have a certain properties like uh, the high high improbability that it could have came about by chance, combined with the fact that it resembled something that has a high degree of specification that appears to be designed. Okay, but so this, take something but, that meets what supposedly is the design criteria, like the, like the bacterial flagellum, and show that 
this thing with a pure design, not just that it uh, doesn't look like it was produced by evolution, but has the appearance of design. It resembles, it bespeaks, it screams out that it was designed. Now show me that that wasn't But But you understand. And, 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 and you falsified the theory. And you understand. Yes. No, but that's a shifting of the burden of that proof. That is completely not how it's it? and, Yes, the hell it's not. Give me a second. First of all, intelligent design is nothing but a big argument from ignorance. All of it. Because how do you recognize that something is designed? Because it resembles characteristics of things that but we that, would that is an say inductive, is that, it is a, that is an inductive argument by analogy, and it is an appeal to ignorance. This looks designed, therefore it was. That's no. false. It is not a sound argument. Sir, I'm, I have a quote. Actually, I know you said you didn't want to hear extensive quotations, but I mean, even Bill Gates, who I, I think has a far more uh, Bill Gates? far more knowledge in, uh, in computer programming, admits that the DNA is literally a computer program, but far more complex. Congra David Congratulations, David. you're now quoting billionaire software designers with respect to biology. You want how far, how much further out there you want to go? Why well, don't I you thought, address I the? Why don't you? Computer why don't you? Biology, why so don't it. you address the point that I made instead of something that is completely irrelevant? I did address your point. No, you didn't. No, see, uh, I asked a question. I asked. Question, I sorry, asked I how answer. you did. How do you? determine that something is designed by an intelligence. And I said, you say it's an argument from analogy, but what I would do is, like biologists have done, find things in nature that do... Uh, at the, at, at first Here you go. You find things let, in let nature finish, that look finish. designed. Let him finish. Okay. Uh, okay, you Sorry. find things in nature that first have the appearance of design. I mean, people who are evolutionists have said the bacterial flagellum looks like it was. It's a I motor swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God, if you just quote one more person instead of actually having a discussion, I'll hang up. Uh, well, you don't want me to cite credible sources? I want you to have it. I don't give a for? damn what you cite. I want to actually have a discussion where we address the issue and you answer the question. And the question's pretty simple. How do you go about determining that something was intelligently designed? You can answer that without saying so and so says. Yeah, I mean that's what I that's I'm simply asking when I asked you in the first place, what does a non-god designed and designer designed universe look like? I'm wanting to get your ideas, okay? Uh -oh. I just just as a, at a baseline level to be able to look at a thing and go, okay, that's designed and that wasn't. How do you make that simple distinction? I don't want to go into big rigmarole about you know how the, the what processes. What the hell Bill Gates thinks? Yeah, what, what what this or that other biologist or software designer thinks. Just in terms of at a basic level, understanding it's cold outside. How do I know it's cold outside? Because I know what it's like when it's hot outside. You know that the, the basic frames of reference in order to be able to draw these comparisons between design and non-design, between hot and cold, between any things that where there is an opposite to be understood. In order, okay. to, in order to comprehend design, it seems to me that you ought to have a pretty good idea of what it means to be non-designed. Okay, so at a very basic level, how do you, not Bill Gates, not one of these other sources that you want to quote to us, how do you go about determining that? Sure. You go in nature and you see systems that, that are motors, literally are motors or are computer programs like the DNA molecule and the bacterial flagellum. Then go and see if they resemble, see if they're irreducibly complex see if they're in fact complex specified information, whether they could have come about uh, uh, very probably by chance, or in fact they couldn't. Then if they have a very specific purpose, and as well as that, there's a, there's a good chance that it might very well be designed. And at any point during this process, do you ever take into consideration the fact that there is a very uh, uh, well-established scientific discipline in evolutionary biology that shows how these life forms, these organisms, these uh, parts of our ecosystem, they do appear to have a sense of purpose, a sense of design, but we understand evolutionarily how they got there, how each of these things fits into its own niche, naturally. Well, I mean, in how every system is an irreducibly complex system. I said no. that was great to go and look for in specific systems. Even, I mean, I, I mean it's, nobody would make the claim that every single system is irreducibly complex. That would be ridiculous to say something like that. Well, I'm but still I, but that wasn't what I was getting at. I'm still waiting for an answer to my question, because when I asked how you tell... Uh, how you determine that something is intelligently designed, you said you go out in nature and find something that looks designed, and then you demonstrate that it's irreducibly complex, and then, it's, and then, okay. you, can make, then you can make the case that it was most probably intelligently designed. 
That is not anything that, that even remotely resembles science or the process of demonstrating something because all you did was say, I go out and find something that looks designed and if I can't find a way that it's not irreducibly complex, I'm going to go ahead and believe that the best explanation is that there's an intelligent designer. That is not how we recognize intelligent design. I can tell you how we recognize intelligent design. For example, I made this the other day. It's a chainmail bracelet, really simple thing. I could leave this outside and everybody would be able to tell that it was intelligently designed. And it has nothing to do with complexity. It has to do with every single example we have of anything remotely like this is designed and we have no examples that this occurs naturally. It is a contrast between naturally occurring and non-naturally occurring. That is how you determine whether or not something is intelligently designed. And it is, it is folly for quasi-biologists to go around asserting that biological systems for which we have a good understanding of how they produced, reproduced naturally are intelligent design. And that is why I keep saying that this is a big argument from ignorance and it is creationism in a lab coat. And well, earlier on, you, you again, uh, you know, you talked about uh, how you thought uh, Kenneth Miller was um, straw manning a lot of Behe's arguments, but all through your explanations, I hear you talking about, uh, you know, the, you, making the usual uh, creationist errors, where you talk about, well, if it, it, it's either just by chance or it has a purpose. But, of course, anyone who studied evolution uh, knows it, it's not a pure chance process. You know, there is nothing simply random uh, and, and simply chancy about natural selection or punctuated equi equilibrium or any of the various theories of evolutionary processes that are out there. Evolution isn't simply, it, it's not a, this false dichotomy between chance or intent. Yeah, it's not and, taking and, all the parts of a motor and throwing yeah. them in a pile and seeing if they, if they mm -hmm. uh, produce something. That's not the way evolution works. So when you misrepresent this as either it's chance or it was intelligently designed, you are poison in the well so that your argument looks more appealing. That's a straw man that you're attacking as soon as you start talking about chance. Okay, let me, let me respond to both points. First about the uh, falsifiability of intelligent design, and then I'll respond to the, uh, the word randomness, then, which is essentially what you're getting at. As, as for uh, Matt, I think that was a great analogy, and I agree with you completely about how you would uh, recognize that the, uh, that the bracelet is designed and everything. But if you go and you take the flagellum, which has been accepted by many, many biologists to literally be a motor, function as a motor, any single motor I've ever seen is the product of intelligence. No, when you, when, no. When you find a more sophisticated motor, well, back to why, is it, why is it preposterous to go and say it might be from a designer? Well, because we have evidence that it occurs naturally. What what evidence do we have of a motor ever appearing naturally? That, see, that's what I'm not understanding. Because any motor, uh, first I mean, of all, motor, first of all, that I've seen come from some kind of design. First of all, you've already given the exam example, and that's the bacterial flagellum. Now, second of all, you're making the same equivocation fallacy problem that we had three weeks ago when I was in the show, where the guy called in to talk about DNA as a code, and I tried to say, ex explain how he was, he was confusing himself. When we make, when we, we say that some things are, uh, you know, that DNA is a code, yes, in many respects it is, but that is, that is an analogy, and it is improper to imply that it is a code in the common sense of the word, where a code is to convey inform intelligent information from one intelligence to another. DNA does not do that. DNA is an entirely mechanical, chemical process. It's not conveying information from an intelligence to an intelligence. So it is a code by analogy. In the sense of the bacterial flagellum, when we call it a motor, we are saying it operates as a motor. That, that is a description of, of what it does just as my arm is a fulcrum. Okay, so what? Yeah, I, my eye is a camera. It operates right. as a motor. So what I'm saying is why can't, I mean, we're using, we're, we're using mechanical terms. We're using the terms that we use to describe machines to describe the thing. So why can't we take that extra step and say, well, maybe it's not just an appearance of design, as somebody like Richard Dawkins would like to say, or maybe it really is design. I mean, because I mean, you can't saying, make that, you can't make that huge leap. It's like Mark was just yeah. saying, we could say that my eye is a camera. But now we have an example of man-made cameras and cameras that occur naturally. You can't make the leap to say that because it has a function, 
it might I, yeah. probably have been designed and not just have the appearance of design and therefore we're justified in believing there's an intelligent designer. Yeah. There's a huge gap there that you have not crossed with anything more than this is what I want to believe. Yeah, I mean, the, the no, simple well, that, similarity. No, that's not true, Matt. That, the, that, what did, what did you cross not, it with? That's all we want to believe. That's not the criteria. What did you cross that use. gap with? The simple similarity in function between uh, something in nature and something that is an artifact, a man-made artifact, is not in and of itself evidence or even an argument that the thing that occurs in nature therefore must have been designed and intentionally constructed just like the artifact was. I mean, if the only ponds you had ever come across were ones that had been designed by landscapers, when you came across a pond that wasn't designed by a landscaper, you might be inclined to think that it was designed by a landscaper, and you'd be wrong. And that's the difference between deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. So if you think you crossed that gap with more than this is what I want to believe, what did you cross the gap from there's an appearance of design to therefore it was intelligently designed? Where's the gap crosser? Okay, uh, two points, actually. One I'm not saying absolutely 100% we know for a fact that it's designed. I mean, no scientist would say 100%, they're 100% sure, really, about really any theory. 100% certain. I, did, did I I'm say. It probably. Did I say 100% certain at any time? I don't even recall the last show where I said that because I reject absolute certainty across the board. You don't need to tell me about that. You need to answer the question. Well, you said to me, uh, how do we make that leap from it appears to be designed that we know it was designed. So I'm saying we don't know for 100%. But I never said 100%, so skip it and get to the answer. Okay. Besides having the appearance of design, besides really, besides really being a motor or, or functioning as a motor, if it's irreducibly complex, if it contains complex specified information, and it, and it resembles things that we normally say are designed. Well, we know it's not irreducibly complex why because... Why can't we say that it might be designed? I mean, I'm giving you several criteria on here to evaluate. Well, again, because, again, from, from the very basic uh, level of its, its premise to begin with, we know that Behe's idea of irreducible complexity isn't valid because we can take that little uh, flagellum motor apart. We can, you know, where Behe says, if you take one thing apart, none of it works. Right? As a flagellum. But you can, as a flagellum. But it's something, yeah. but see, that's, that's, the, that's the false criteria. Uh, that's the criteria. false premise that is defining intelligent design into existence. Right. I reject his definition as useless. It, it doesn't even, does it have any predictive value? Does it have any predict? Well, you can predict what systems would be irreducibly complex. And how? You test how? That is how? How? Do how do you predict it? Yeah, I mean, how, before something is supposedly irreducibly complex, if all of its individual parts can't do anything because they haven't yet formed, can't do the same job, can't because they haven't yet formed the irreducibly complex thing that doesn't exist yet. How do you propose to look at all of these individual elements and say and predict that together they would form an irreducibly complex deal? How do you how do you how do you have that predictive? Well, the way you falsify or well, you have to take the complete system and then try to take out a part. And the idea is, if it can, yeah, but, it, but if that if that complete system doesn't exist, how how see from an evolutionary standpoint, right? Yeah, you you could have you could say, in order in order to get this kind of organism or this kind of system. Uh, to work in a certain way, we would need to see these kinds of processes, these earlier stages, as it were, just like rough drafts leading up to the final draft. We we would have to see a record of this, and and you, and if you look, uh, you know, from from the evolutionary premise, you can take the irreducibly complex, allegedly irreducibly complex uh, flagellum tail, take out bits of its motor, and see, okay, before these things were the things that are making a tail motor, they did other things, they had other functions, and we see how they developed to to, to get to from where they were then to what they are now. At, if you take intelligent design as your premise. Well, then how do you say, well, at, at, at what point the, did the designer take this little gizmo that did a thing and pop it into some other thing and make it this new thing that is irreducibly complex? Where do you see that in I mean, the whole developmental process of this organism? I mean, this is... To where, you can, to where you can now identify and say, there is the scientific evidence of an intelligent designer at hand. And once it was like this, and now it's like this, and there is a specific thing we can point to which is the intervention of, of an intelligent agency and can be no other thing. This is, this is probably not morphologically accurate, but take the human nose, for example. Really, really it's fairly simple. Um, right now, I smell with mine. I can also breathe with it, but generally, I smell with it because I could breathe with my mouth if I was, you know, in Virginia. Um, but Zing. once upon a time, 
that nose might have had a different function where smell wasn't part of it. So what it seems to me is now we have a good understanding of this and, and it's in its various functions, but it seems to me that B's definition says, if I take a part away and it no longer has the same function, aha, it's irreducibly complex. Yes, and, 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 and then the point is, it's very, and the more systems like that you find, the more improbable it is that you, because now you have to account for an indirect pathway for each and every one of these systems. And I mean, B, and B, he argues, uh, that there's hundreds of these systems out there, and, and now for, and now essentially, for every one of these systems that you have to uh, explain with an indirect pathway, I mean, you, you have to first account for the fact that some, at some point in time, all the parts are together, then they were synchronized the right way, in the same place, at the same time. And no, I mean, no, you don't have incredible. to. No, yeah. you don't have to. And that's, that's the response that real evolutionary biologists have been, have been putting out for years. You don't have to have them all in place, all at the same time, all synchronized. Some of them can have different functions for long periods of time. Some of them can have no function. Evolution doesn't just select for something, it selects against things. And as long as something is relatively innocuous, like for example, uh, my earlobe doesn't really have any, any good function. Uh, but, and who knows, maybe a million years down the line, my ear, earlobe will, you know, evolve into something, or the human earlobe, not mine, I'll be dead, uh, will evolve into something that some future uh, intelligence will claim is irreducibly complex. It is, as I said at the outset, an argument from ignorance. It is, as I said a moment ago, a definition that is defining intelligent design into existence. There's no reason to accept his definition of irreducible complexity as useful or valid in any sense. Sorry. It's, well, the reason why I'm saying it's useful is because now, it, it, because before you found out that the system was irreducibly complex, you could have said that it could have just evolved in a very direct way, step by step by step. No, now, no, you couldn't have. You, no, you have to no. Pathway because Gary, Gary, this is where you. No. Keep, this is where you keep getting things wrong, Gary. You keep talking about. Well, you can just make this leap, or you could just said this, or you could have just uh, decided this. Or this isn't how we determine things in science. You look at evidence. You look at lineages. You look at uh, you, ev what. You look at the actual data that's out there. It's not a matter of well, you could just say this, or you could just say that, and so why not just say the thing that makes the most sense? I mean, which seems to be the whole idea that you're trying to sell us you here. You just said that without irreducible complexity, you could claim that it came by direct, uh, direct evolution. No, that's, that's not that it. Possibility no, first. that's that's not it. it. You are making the implication that that irreducible complexity is not only a valid hypothesis, but it's that it's necessary in order for us to determine the actual process. And the answer to that is you're freaking wrong because science is going to explain that or not explain it based on the evidence and going where the evidence leads. You don't need, you don't need irreducible complexity as a stopgap that, or as a, as a bridge that leads somewhere because as I mentioned before, where it's leading you is to the intelligent design conclusion and it's doing so without any basis at all. It is an argument from analogy. It is an argument from ignorance. Begging the question. It is, it is, Everything that could be wrong with it is. And when I asked before about how you bridge this gap between something looks designed and therefore it is most likely designed, your answer is Michael Behe's definition of irreducible complexity. Oh, well, that and wasn't my answer to that question. I'll no, that no, Gary, Gary, like. Gary, that was your answer. Yours was just a lot longer. You bridge but the gap between it looks designed and it most probably is designed by appealing to Behe's definition of irreducible complexity. That's part of it, but that's not the whole, that's not... All What's the rest do. of it? The rest of it is, first of all, determine how, how probable it is that it could have formed by, uh, if you don't want to use the word random, an unguided process. And how do you do that? A high degree yeah. specification how it. do you assess the probability? What's your denominator? What? Okay, I'm, I'm not a mathematician to it, but I mean... Obviously. But, well, I mean, yeah, I'm a, I'm a college student. I don't have a PhD in mathematics. No, but you understand probabilities, right? I, I said that's the way I, you would go about doing it. I right, and if you I've have no other, if you have no other examples, if you have nothing to compare it to, if you have no way of, de of determining the denominator, you can't come up with a probability. Yeah, because this just gets you back to my question again, Gary. It's like if you if you want to assert that a thing is designed, if you want to assert that there, is, that there is a higher probability that a thing is designed than otherwise, then you have to know certain things. You have to know 
what would this thing be like were it not designed? You have to have a definition of non-design to, to use as a frame of reference to set against your definition of design. And if you want to say there's a greater probability of one over the other, you have to, you have to know how to work out that probability. And if okay? you're assessing... I mean, when they say here that you, what the probability is of winning the Powerball every week, I mean, that's an actual... They work that math out based on real data. You know, in terms of how many tickets are bought by people, what the, what the jackpot is, you know, how, what, how many states the sales are in, et cetera, et cetera. How many millions of people are out there spending their dollars on, on Powerball every week. They actually, do, and, and then what the, the, the likelihood of, of the numbers coming up in the little spinning machine, right? I mean, that's, that's actual data. They don't just come up with one in 37 million jillion off the top of their heads. They work that out. So if you want to work out the greater probability of a designed life form to, with a non-designed life form, you have to know what both of those things look like, and you have to have your data points to be able to make that probability. You can't just say, well, it looks that way, so it just seems more likely. And that, and, really, and has been, that. And that really has been all you've been saying this entire conversation. Well, but it looks more like There's this. one more thing that he said, which is, is something that creationists have said a lot of, in addition to the, it looks this way, therefore it most likely is this way, is this issue of probability. And that is an argument that, well, evolution just seems so unlikely. Well, why is that? Well, that's a valid claim. I mean, I know people on both sides of the, uh, of the debate who have supposedly calculated the, uh, the mathematical improb uh, improbability score. I mean, I know for a fact that this issue was discussed in the Dover trial and on the intelligent design side of it. I know Dr. William Dembski has gone and written by extensive algorithms on the subject. Yeah, and I, mean, I know, and I know why he's wrong. He makes the same mistake that a lot of creationists make, and that is that they assume that this thing must have occurred once, and you're doing one trial instead of a pool of resources with continual attempts. And that, this is all about abiogenesis anyway, and now we're way off, and we've had you on for like 30 minutes or so. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to another caller. All right, we're not gonna, my call, yeah, we appreciate, appreciate the argument. I appreciate um, it. We're, we're not going to agree, and primarily we're not going to agree because you accept that Behe's definition of irreducible complexity is valid and useful, and I think it's a steaming pile yeah, of crap. So, so we're, we're, we're just, we're just not on the same page with premises. On this one. And, I mean, again, thank yeah, you for your time. Yeah, un unfortunately, that whole agree to disagree and everybody has an opinion is useless because there is such a thing as truth, and there are such things as right answers, and I'm going to believe that we have the best right answer when it's actually supported by the evidence and not supported by analogy, induction, looks designed, therefore is most likely designed. The time to believe that there's a designer is when it's actually been demonstrated to be most likely true, not a second before. Well, I'm, I'm going to believe that the methods that Dr. Behan and Dr. Dembski have used, uh, and as well as the other design theorists who identify design in nature, as I've said to you before, irreducible complexity and specified complexity, I'm gonna, I, I think that those are valid ways to do it. I mean, and, and well, good for you, but you're incorrect. So let's cool, and there's plenty of people that, that believe if they pray, they'll get better. But yeah.